the plan this week, the uh, rest of this week, <laughs> is to have a whirlwind uh, tour of uh, some data analysis because the, so far we've talked about collecting data but uh, not much about what to do with it and in particular um, data data analysis of of uh, time series uh, because you're collecting a time series with functional MRI and then you've got to do something with that so so I'm going to start off uh, talking about something that I know a lot about because I because I did it uh, and it's it's very similar to the more standard method for uh, analyzing functional MRI data uh, and it's it's linear everything's you know everything just like the standard method is and so uh, it's uh, particularly useful for uh, figuring out maps in the brain um, uh, as opposed to doing more high-level cognitive uh, experiments where you do something in a block. But as we'll see, uh, you can actually, can actually use it for higher-level things as well. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, convolution uh, again. So I already talked about convolution, but now we'll just explicitly go over convolution in the context of uh, estimating a hemodynamic response function. And then uh, on Friday, I'll talk about kind of the standard linear model, which we'll, which we'll use uh, use convolution uh, and hopefully we'll get an idea of like why why it makes sense to sort of do that funny flip that you have in in convolution so so back to sort of phase encoded mapping so this this involves the Fourier transform so it's another another use for the Fourier transform so in many cognitive experiments what you might do is you know you'll have several different blocks like you know here's a block of uh, upside down faces, here's a block of right side up faces, or here's a block where you're doing a math problem, here's a block where you're, you're just, uh, uh, say, looking for a letter, or something like that. Um, now, you typically have a number of conditions, maybe two, three, you know, four different conditions, but if you're trying to figure out, if you're trying to figure out whether there's a map in an area, uh, you, you basically need to like in the case of a visual map, you need to sort of interrogate a whole bunch of different parts of the visual field. Uh, and so you need like, you know, 60 conditions or 80 conditions. And, that, and that's, not, that's not very practical with sort of a standard, standard block design. And so what are, we, what are we talking about? We're talking about doing something, trying to do something that's kind of similar to what people do with experimental animals. So if you're uh, say, say, you know, there's, there's an area called MT. It's a small little area in humans, like a little over a centimeter. And it has a visual map in it, a, a map of the, of the visual world. And how would you figure that out in an animal? You would put, you know, a microelectrode down there somewhere into that area. And then you would find the part of the visual field that causes cells at that point to become active, and that's called the receptive field. So the receptive field, uh, you could do the same thing for the somatosensory system, go somewhere into the somatosensory system with an electrode and then touch around the body and find the little part of the finger, for instance, that would cause those cells to become active. So in, in an invasive experiment, you would put the electrode in a bunch of different places and actually uh, reveal this map of the visual world. And so the, so the question is, how could you possibly do something, something like that uh, with fMRI? Because there's so many different parts of the visual world. And so that's where uh, the Fourier transform comes to the rescue. So, um, so how, would, how would you do this? So say we had uh, a receptive field that was over here. So that's a part of the visual field. Now I'm drawing, this is the this is the visual field here that we're drawing. So, you know, like <coughs> this is where, th that's the, the center of the visual field wh where you're looking at, where your highest resolution part of your fovea is. So this is, uh, this is the visual field, not, not case space. Visual field. So one thing you could do is you could uh, take like a little 
checkerboard. Uh, so, you know, wh why? And that's flashing back and forth. So, kind of at an epileptogenic sort of speed. So it turns out if you, f if you flash a little checkerboard, like make the, the dark ones light and the light ones dark, uh, like this, at about uh, like eight transitions per second, turns out that is like the, the way to get the biggest rise out of the cortex. That's why something like that can be epileptogenic, because it kind of, it's kind of like the intrinsic oscillation frequency of the cortex in a way, and it causes the most activity. So, uh, so you do that, um, uh, and then you slowly rotate this around, like maybe, you know, you know, uh, one rote per six, say, 64 seconds, yeah, and rote, uh, 64 seconds. So it very slowly goes around, and then what will happen is at some point it'll run into where the receptive field is. This requires that the person is fixating, so that they, they fixate the center. They don't look at that thing. They just have to look at the center all the time. Um, and so, so what will happen if we record, say, you know, eight minutes of data like that? So uh, what, what, what will happen is you'll get a, a time series. And, you know, it's, it's bold, so it's going to, you know, it's going to be kind of sort of typical sloppy bold, so there'll be some, uh, there'll be some sort of background noise, and then m maybe the signal will go up a little bit after a while, when, say, 30 seconds later when, it, when the, the checkerboard gets there, and then it will sort of go down, and then it will, next time it comes around, you'll, you'll get something like that. And then this time you were f sort of falling asleep, and so there was nothing very big, and then maybe you woke up again, and then, you know, and then, you moved a little bit, and so there was like a little bit of a movement. And so you get like, well, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, eight. Okay, so there's, there's our signal. So what is, so, you know, what is the signal? This is just, you know, voxel brightness. Now, this isn't zero-based, so the, the type of modulation we're talking about is, you know, a couple, per, couple percent. So it's a small... You know, zero is zero is way down here. So, so what can we do with that? Well, um, uh, we could do a Fourier transform of it. And so, if we do a Fourier transform of that, well, what are we going to get? So, we'll we'll turn uh, time into frequency. And so, um, now remember. To, yeah, before we do the Fourier transform, uh, remember when we're doing a Fourier transform, we're going to have to uh, substitute in zero for the imaginary part. So here's the real part, and there's the imaginary part. So we, so we stick in a zero into the um, into the imaginary part, and uh, then we can do a Fourier transform. So now. Um, now we do, you know, FT, so here's FT, and what we'll get out of that is uh, a complex spectrum, which uh, will have real and imaginary, so uh, th that will turn it into real and imaginary, so, you know, we'll, we'll have all these different frequencies, real and imaginary, and then typically we'll turn that into amplitude and phase, you know, so we just take the, you know, here's the, you know, real and imaginary, turn that into amplitude and phase, and that's the way we would typically look at it. And so, so here's amplitude and phase down here, still as a function of frequency. So, so what are you going to get if you happened, so if you were in an area that wasn't visual and you did this, and nothing happened, you would just sort of get, uh, you would get noise. But if you were in an area that, that had a visual receptive field in it, in a voxel that had a visual receptive field in it, then what you ought to get is uh, some sort of low frequency, you know, stuff going on, because we'll talk about why we get that from motion artifact, and then there should be a spike in the spectrum at, uh, at 8. So there's so 
what that means is that there's a reasonable amount of sort of of, of eight of an eight cycle sinusoid in the signal. Uh, so how could you use, use something like this for mapping? Well, imagine we've got another receptive field that's over here, say. Uh, it's a little closer in. And so what's going to happen with that one? There's going to be a delay. So what's going to happen with that guy is that when you look at the time course, you, you'll, you'll see, you know, you'll see the same sort of uh, eight stripes, but that one's going to be systematically delayed a little bit compared to the other one like that. And so, so how can we tell those apart? They would both have a spike in the amplitude spectrum. So this, this is our original you know, output of the Fourier transform, and then here's after we converted it. So they would, they would both have an, uh, a spike in 8, but what would happen is if we looked at the phase angle, so the phase angle you know, would go from you know, um, pi to minus pi or 0 to 360, whatever. So, so you, you, you essentially have a, a phase number for each frequency. And so what you could do is, uh, you know, go down to the to the eight, uh, you know, frequency equals eight in the phase picture, which is you know down here. Find that number, and what that number will do is tell you essentially what the delay is. Uh, and so, so that's a way of um, uh, that, that's a way of. Um, so by looking at the phase angle, you could essentially tell where you were in the map. And, uh, you know, you could divide the visual field up into, you know, effectively 60 or 100 different angles of the receptive field. So what you're measuring, you're just, so, you know, here's that receptive field and here's that receptive field. What you're measuring is just that angle or, you know, that, that angle like that. So that's that corresponds will correspond to your phase uh, phase angle, and so you could you could thereby figure out what the angle was. You can't figure out the distance from the center, so we'll get to that in a second. But but what about this? Uh, you know, what about this sort of low frequency part? You know, wh where does that come from? That'll always be there in the signal, and where that comes from is is. Think about what happened if you moved a little bit. So if you if you move in the scanner, what what can happen? Um, so if you've got your brain here like that, and this is I, I'm drawing it even bigger than it is, uh, but say there's a voxel there, and say you moved a little bit. So say say you moved like this. Now, hopefully you wouldn't move that much, but, uh, but now let's look at this voxel here. So, you know, what happens in that voxel? Well, at the beginning, it kind of looked like this. And um, after you moved, it looked like this. So that signal, and how, how do you move? Well, you could cough or swallow or something like that. But more commonly, you would just slowly, slowly sink back down into the, into the cushions or slowly rotate a little bit. And we could try to remove that with motion artifact, but there's always going to be uh, somewhat of a signal in there. And so completely uncorrected, that could be like a 20 or 50% change in brightness. And so that's going to completely swamp our little tiny, you know, this, uh, this, this thing right here is, you know, maybe in V1, the best area, you know, best area, this, this might be, you know, 10%, but, you know, a lot of times, say, like, you know, 3% or something, we're talking about a small, a, a small change. And so if you've got a 50% change from the motion, obviously that's going to, you know, mess it up. If somebody moved, there would be like a big low frequency peak right there. Okay, so now that we've got this, how can we actually uh, kind of do statistics on it? So this this will tell you know the phase will tell us where we are in the map, but how can we do a you know statistics on this? 
And what we could do is we could first say, well, I don't want that motion. I'm just going to ignore that part of the spectrum. Now, the thing about the Fourier transform, it's a linear transformation. And so what are we doing? We're basically just doing something exactly equivalent to regressing out motion. We're essentially just saying uh, we're linearly subtracting out the motion signal, just like you would do in a, in a more standard analysis. Uh, but once you've sort of decomposed the thing, decomposed your, spe your spectrum of, of signals into frequencies, motion is low frequency. Uh, uh, and so, so then what we could do is say, this is our signal. That's our signal. And then this, this stuff, this stuff is the noise. And, and what is, you know, what is noise? Noise is some kind of, kind of random fluctuations. Could be, you know, there's probably heartbeat in there, other things in there. But that's different than this stuff that we removed, which is a real signal. I mean, motion is a giant signal. This was a giant time course signal. We, we just took it out. And so we call, you know, <coughs> this guy is noise. Th these are nuisance that we kind of subtracted out. So uh, what, what does nuisance mean? It sort of means, um, it means something that's actually a real signal that we don't want, whereas noise is just kind of random fluctuations uh, that we're going to compare our signal to. And so then what we could do is essentially do, you know, a signal to noise or, or an F ratio, variance ratio, uh, using, the, using the amplitude at the eight cycle compared to, you know, the average amplitude of all the, all the other noise frequencies. And so then we could get like a, a statistic out of it, a, a kind of a standard, you know, p-value out of it. So, so, that's a, so, so basically we could figure out where we are on the map by looking at the phase and then uh, figure out how significant the response was because obviously there's other Savannah sensory cortex might not care about you know, where you are in the visual field, in which case you just have noise and there won't be any peak uh, at the eight cycle, uh, at this uh, eight cycle here. And so in that case, you would get sort of an, an insignificant result, not activated. So this, however, doesn't, uh, doesn't help you with um, the, uh, uh, the other part of the uh, visual field map, which is the distance from the center. And so what you could do uh, is you could make a little circular checkerboard like this and, uh, and, and flash that guy and then uh, just expand that one. So, so there we've got, we got a circular checkerboard flashing back and forth at an epileptogenic uh, frequency to get lots of uh, visual signal out of there. And, and then what we could do with that one was just expand this one. So the, the person's looking at the center all the time, and you could, uh, you could expand it. Uh, and how, how would you expand it? You would expand it you know, over time. You know, if here's in and here's out, you would expand it like that and then go back, pop back to the center and then go out again like that. So you know, every, every minute, do that. Etc. And so then what would happen is if <coughs> you'd be able to distinguish the, the distance from the center of these receptive fields because we need, we need two dimensions for a visual map. And so um, if we did that, then if we did both of those, uh, then we could, uh, uh, we, we could actually visualize uh, a map, not just an MT. This, the, the advantage of this compared to doing it with an electrode is you're recording the whole brain. <laughs> and so you could essentially do that same analysis at every voxel. And so you could see all different, that's how you could visualize all different visual maps across, across the brain. Uh, but since, since it's linear, Fourier transform is just decomposing things into these linear sum. It's a linear sum. It's just the sum of these different frequencies. You know, you have to consider the, 
the amplitude and the phase of each frequency, but basically it's still a linear sum. And so you could do them at the same time. And instead of using irritating checkerboards, you could use uh, pleasant vacation photos. And so, so here's, here's a way to do it both at the same time. So why not just put a wedge in there and then put a, uh, so here's a, ch uh, a checkerboard wedge or maybe just a little aperture into some vacation photos and then just put a, uh, just put a ring in there at the same time. Uh, and so, so we've got a, so we, so we have this ring and this, uh, this wedge there. And the wedge, say, you know, move the wedge around sort of eight times and expand the ring, say, 11 times. So the frequency of the repeated stimulus for the, uh, for the uh, wedge is different than the frequency. And since frequencies are orthogonal to each other, uncorrelated with each other, then when we did our um, Fourier analysis, what we would end up with is some noise, and then there should be a peak at 8, and then another peak at 11. So this is frequency after we've done, you know, taking the data FT, and then we get, we get uh, amplitude and phase. So what we could do then, and then there'd be a bunch of different phases down here. So what we could do is we could say, uh, you know, for 8, we, you know, go down and find out what the phase was at 8. And then for 11, we go down and find out what the phase was at 11. And so then we could map, we could map the, the eccentricity, center, the distance from the center of gaze, and then the, uh, the polar angle uh, at the same time. Uh, because these things will sort of approximately, approximately add to each other. So, so that's that's fun. Uh, so that was all, all our our visual mapping. But you can do the same same sort of thing for um, for uh, auditory mapping. So if you look at um, the auditory system, the auditory system has maps of frequency in it. And what, is this co this, what does this come from? It comes from the fact that your cochlea essentially does a Fourier transform of sound coming in. A Fourier transform, once again, it, it basically decomposes sounds into different frequencies. And then it represents them along the stretch of the cochlea. And then that stretch of the cochlea is actually mapped into the cortex. And so there are, if you look in the cortex, you'll find maps of frequency in the auditory system. And uh, so one thing about the map, there's this similar thing happening in the visual. I didn't mention it, but, you know, there's more representation at the center of gaze. There's a finer-grained map at the center of gaze and a, a less fine-grained map as you move out. Same thing happens. Um, there's, there's a similar kind of exponential kind of thing going on in the, in the auditory system. So if you, if you look at an auditory map, if you if you find the representation of, say, 100 hertz, like, mm, so that, you know, that's about 100 hertz, you, you'll find something like that. If you go an octave up, which is twice the frequency, duh, so that's 200 hertz, you'll, you'll find something like that. And then if you go uh, double 200 hertz, that would be, duh, so there's uh, 400, 400 hertz. But it turns out 400 is about, the same distance from 200 that 200 is from 100 because it's kind of an exponential representation of, of frequency. And then I, uh, 800 hertz, I can't do that one, but that's up here. <laughs> so in order to respect that, what would you do when you did your map of frequency? You would just uh, sort of make an, an exponential ramp in frequency like that and then go back down and then back up. And so you could, you could do that eight times, et cetera. Um, and you could do more naturalistic things, like one thing that we've used is take pop music, which is designed to be very loud. And how do you do that? You make all frequencies in it. So the spectrum of pop music tends to be very flat. And so there's always something somewhere in pop music. And so then you can filter the pop music into just like the bass or the mid-range or the vocals or or the drums, 
and with, a, with a filter and, and ramp that filter up sort of exponentially. And then what would that do? That would cause, you know, basically a, a little band of activity to slowly go across, you know, go across the cortex. And if you were sitting at a particular voxel, uh, you would get something that looks like this again. You know, there would be like eight little bumps in there. And then if you took the Fourier transform and then uh, figured out what the phase was, you could figure out what the frequency of the representation in all these different auditory areas were. So this is, you know, this guy is, you know, uh, visual over here. And this is uh, auditory. And you could do the same thing in the somatosensory system. So in the somatosensory system, uh, now notice there's a difference here. So the, this is basically a 2D representation uh, in the visual system. In the auditory system, it's basically just a 1D representation, just frequency. There's other things represented along this axis, but uh, there's only one dimension to frequency. And th the reason for that is that the, the, the cochlea is just a line is basically a line of hair cells that respond to different frequencies. And so, um, so there's, only, there's only 1D over here. But if you go to the somatosensory system, it's 2D again. So like uh, if, you look at, uh, if you look at your hand, for instance, so if you look at, at the structure of your hand, uh, your hand is, um, uh, it's got two Ds, 2D to it. So there's the thumb and the, the fingers. Uh, and so you could do a, a similar kind of uh, mapping experiment on the hand, which we've done. Uh, you could use, uh, back in the day, we just used a plastic fork, but you know, you could, you could use like a, a scientific little air puff stimulator. And so what you could do is you could start like stimulating the little finger like that, and then slowly move across the fingers or you could, you know, start at the tips of the fingers like that, and then, you know, slowly, slowly move uh, toward toward the palm, and and so then, you know, once again, you've got uh, you've got a two D uh, representation. So you have to do it's harder to do those both at the same time, uh, but uh, you could even do those both at the same time, like with the with the uh, with the visual system. And so why all this focus on mapping? Well, maybe about a half of the brain. So if you do this all across the brain, about a half of the brain contains some kind of sensory or motor map. And so a half of the brain doesn't have an obvious sensory or motor map, but, but 50 per, full 50% of it does. And so it's a useful way for sort of dividing up, uh, dividing up the brain. Now, you can apply this to, uh, to a more sort of cognitive experiment. So I'll give just one example. I, th I think I put it in the readings if you want to look at it. It's an experiment that I, at Ray Song, one of my former students did. Uh, it applies to any kind of paradigm that has periodicity in it. All, all you have to do is just do something in a periodic, in a periodic fashion in order, in order to get this to, uh, get this to work. And so, you know, what the, the one <coughs> experiment that, uh, that Ray Song did to me was uh, reach to eat. Now, uh, we, we didn't actually eat uh, in, in the scanner, but the plan is, uh, you're looking at the screen, and there's a little fixation spot, and then, and then uh, something comes up in some part of the screen. So uh, it was mostly junk food, but we'll we'll make an uh, a half an apple here. Sort of there's a there's an apple, a nice healthy apple, and then um, and then you you reach out to it. So here, so the apple, go, the apple is still on the screen, and and you're, uh, you you know you, you reach your hand out to it, to sort of grab it, and then, um, the apple, goes off, and you, and you bring your your, your hand you know back to your mouth. So you know here here you are, 
There's your, um, your, your upside down. So here's your, there's your mouth. And so you pretend, uh, pretend to eat that apple. And so what you can do uh, is you could do that over the space of about 16, say 16 seconds, so a slow reach to eat. And all you have to do is just time it so that, you know, you time the, when the fixation point is and, and, and practice the person so that they can basically sort of make that same, that same motion uh, periodically and do that, you know, eight or 16 times. And then what you can do is you can actually, uh, you can sort of decompose this, you know, higher level uh, action. And you could do that, you could do that for something like a sentence. So you could take a sentence, uh, a whole bunch of sentences that had the same kind of structure to them and slowly read them. Uh, and you could, you, could do the, you could do the same thing. So there's, there's multiple higher level things. And another example is, say you've got um, somebody, you know, fixating at the center and they, uh, a target comes on someplace and then uh, the target, say, goes off. So, you know, there's a target and then it goes off and there's a little delay and then you make a saccade, saccade to the target. So now, now you actually look at where the target used to be. So here's where the target used to be. So, and then you keep doing that, you know, et cetera. And you can do something like change the location of the target. So like the next time the target comes up, uh, we'll put it uh, down here. So the next time the target comes up, it's in, a, it's in a new place. So now the target is over here. So the target has moved. And so what's happening is the target is slowly moving. Maybe the target's moving around once, uh, once a minute. And that, but you're making saccades, you know, every 10 seconds or five or 10 seconds, something like that. And so again, what would happen is you could decompose this, you know, into something like here's the, a signal that varies with what the remembered location was. And here's another signal that varies with the saccade. So this would be like, you know, uh, that would be like, say, eight cycles. And this might be, say, 50 cycles because you did 50 saccades. So this is, uh, so this one tells you the amplitude of the signal uh, as a function of different remembered locations. So, you know, mapped remembered locations. And then this, this one is the, is related to the saccade. And then when you looked at the phase, what would the phase tell you? Well, the phase would tell you, so here's, you know, the amplitude and here's the phase. So, you know, the, the phase at eight cycles would tell you where the map of remembered locations was. So that would be this phase. And what would the phase of the saccade tell you? That, that would tell you what part of the saccade process were you in? Were you in sort of the fixation part? Or were you in the actually making the saccade? Or were you... This in, in the part after you'd saccaded it back to the, to the center. So you would have sort of like you could decompose the, the parts of the saccade action separately from some map of remembered locations. So it's possible. So the, the, the bottom line was that you can use this kind of approach. It's a relatively general approach that can be used for a higher level things, including things that don't even you know, involve, involve maps. So, like things like attention. And it turns out, you know, if you actually look, you look at a lot of these maps in the brain, a lot of them are, are more than just, they're, they're not just simple sort of sensory maps because it turns out if you put junk everywhere in the visual field but have somebody vary their attention slowly around, around the visual field, you'll find the same map. So even though there's, something present all over the visual field, if you, if you cue somebody basically to slowly just pay attention to stuff at this part and then just pay attention to this stuff at this part and this part, you'll see the exact same map as you would even though the entire visual field is being stimulated. So, yeah, so there's, there's cognitive, cognitive possibilities also. I've, I've tried experiments like this with simple sentences looking for, 
different parts of the brain they become active during different parts of different parts of the sentence so okay so that was uh phase encoded mapping sort of non-standard thing to start off with uh, but it's good to sort of have a, a more general approach to this because it's all linear. It's just, you know, a Fourier transform is just another sort of uh, linear method. So now let's just sort of go into the standard, the more standard type of analysis, which would be sort of a general linear model with some kind of estimated hemodynamic response function. And in order to do that, we have to we have to go back to uh, convolution. So, so convolution. So let's now now we'll do it in time. So, so the convolution of two functions uh, as a function of time is. So if, there's several different ways to write this that you'll see. So you'll see it. Uh, you know, written as. Uh, you could use, sometimes they just use a star, but a star could get, be, be confused with multiplication, so sometimes they put a circle around it. Uh, and so there's two, two functions of time that we're convolving, so we're, we're essentially, it's a relationship between two functions. Sometimes uh, this is, uh, you know, written out as, uh, as you know, something like, uh, you know, F star, G uh, as a function of time, so you, you can see it. You can see it sort of written out that way too. It means sort of the same, uh, the same thing. Um, now, the thing about convolution, convolution is commutative, so uh, that means uh, you can do it in the opposite order. So, so. F convolved with G is the same as G convolved with F. Uh, and so it doesn't matter what, which one we identify as the hemodynamic response function, we could do it for either one. But if we call this guy, the, the first one, the hemo hemodynamic response function, what does that mean? That means like if we suddenly do something, like a flash of light, and then we look at what happens to the blood flow, we get some, you know, so if we do a flash of light like this over time, and then we look at what happens to the blood flow, we'll get something that sort of looks like that. The blood flow or blood oxygenation goes up and then it sort of dies off. And so that's the thing. So we could call that guy the, the kernel. Uh, you know, it's kind of, it tends to be smaller. It turns out the general definition of convolution, the kernel is the same width as the, uh, as, as the thing that you're, you know, that you're convolving with. Uh, and but you could just think of this thing as the filter, like the Photoshop filter, like you're you're putting a a blurring filter uh, uh, on onto your image. So so there's our hemodynamic response function, and then this guy is is the experimental design. And what is the experimental design? It's just a bunch of impulses that you know. It's like up right side up faces or upside down faces. Uh, you either get like an upside down face impulse or a right side up face impulse. And if you keep the faces on for five seconds, you could just imagine that's just like five impulses all stuck to each other. So, so what is the equation for convolution? It's kind of a little bit like a Fourier transform. It's clearly related to the Fourier transform because we talked about the you know, convolution theorem. Uh, and we have another variable that's another variable for time. You sometimes you use lambda there, but we'll just uh, stick z there. And so now it's a sum across all time of that uh, that other uh, variable. So this so that's basically going across all time. And then so we go to some place in the kernel in time, and then we just that's just the regular multiply. We multiply it by uh, the image, an offset point in the image. So, so here's time minus that z, and then we're summing across all z. But z is another is another variable for time. 
So, so what does that, you know, what does that look like uh, if we draw it out? It's got a minus. Remember, if you put a plus in there, then you get cross correlation. If these functions are the same, you get autocorrelation. So autocorrelation, cross correlation, and convolution are all exactly, basically the, the same thing. But if here's our, so here's our, uh, you know, our gx. So the, you know, gt. So gt. So so that's that's our gt. And then here's our kernel. And so what we're trying to figure out, if we're trying to figure out for a particular point, so if a particular point, say like right here. So how do we calculate the convolution for that point? So that point is is h h of t, and here's uh, f. There's our kernel f of t. So so here's our experimental design, uh, and uh, so what. Um, if we want to figure out the result of convolving our experimental design with a particular hemodynamic response function, how do we do that? We, uh, we put the hemodynamic response function here. So, so here's our, and we'll say how we could try to figure it out, but say we just assume that's what it looks like. And, um, and so now just run this equation. So, so this guy was, you know, uh, Sorry, put him there. So that guy was uh, put him in the wrong place. Okay, so th so this guy uh, is z going that way, uh, but that's just another variable for t, and we'll call this one t. So we can distinguish those. And so how do we figure it out for a particular point in t? Uh, we we go to f of z. And so, um, remember, we have to do all z's. So let's just go, let's try this z right here. Okay, so there's, there's a particular z. And, and then we go to g of whatever time we're at, so whatever time we're at currently, minus z. And so it's just that distance back. So we just go that distance back and get that point. And then we multiply those multiply those two by each other, and then do the same thing uh, for all z. And so then we're going to have to multiply this point times that point, and this point times that point, and this point times that point. And so you can see what will happen is we'll, we'll do this weird sort of like thing where we multiply all those things uh, in this twisted fashion, convolved, uh, convolved fashion. So, what's another way of thinking of it? Why don't we just m forget the uh, forget the uh, swapping and just flip our hemodynamic response function? So this is, you know, this guy is our, you know, experiment. This is HDR. And this is, you know, our, our response. So an easier way of thinking of it, let's just, just flip that function around, around zero, because that's, <coughs> this is z equals zero there. Um, and, and then we could uh, uh, just do things like this, you know, just multi multiply, uh, multiply everything. Uh, just this times this, sort of a simpler way of thinking about it. Now, so that's sort of, when, you know, when it's first introduced this way, it's kind of abstract. You feel like, yeah, it's just like somehow it just doesn't, doesn't, quite, doesn't quite click. Why would you want to do something like that? And so the intuitive way to really think about convolution is let's think of our experimental design uh, like this. So here's, so here's our experimental design. And here's the, the hemodynamic response function. And then here's our you know, output you know, response. 
This is what we're trying to model the actual sort of voxel response. And so, so if our hemodynamic response function looks like, you know, looks something like uh, a little, something like this. So, wh you know, why is this called, this is often called an impulse response function. And the reason for that is uh, if, because it, convolution is linear, um, if we can characterize how the system responds to just an impulse, then we can basically exp we can basically predict how it's going to respond to anything. So that's the that's the power of this. So that if you if, if we know that when we do one impulse, this is what we get, then we could just do an arbitrary number of impulses in in any order, any spacing, and then we could figure out because it's a linear system uh, what the response is going to be. And so an example would be say we've got you know an experiment where we do a, a, a visual flash there, and then we do another, another flash, say, here, and then another flash that's a little closer space, something like that. And so now, what is that going to cause our system to do? So if we go down to the first flash, uh, what's going to happen is you're going to release this impulse response function. So the impulse response function will go up. You just have a copy of it like that, and it will go down. Um, and it will start start going down until it gets about here. Now, if you did nothing else, it would just d continue to die off and look just like that. But now what happens is we will tack another version of that on there like that, just linearly added on. So that's the beauty of linear. And so that will go. And if we didn't do anything else, then what would happen is both of these guys would would fall off because this guy's still falling off and we added that guy on top. But now uh, we did another one, and this, this other one wasn't quite as, it hadn't died off yet, and so now this one's gonna go up even, even higher like that, and then they'll eventually, eventually both fall off. So if you think of it this way, this is, this is a very sort of intuitive way of thinking of it, causal way of thinking of it, because you, know, you, you did something, this kind of a thing comes out, and uh, and then all we do is just linearly add these hemodynamic response functions, impulse response functions to each other to get our output. Now, is this a good model of how the brain works? It's no. <laughs> like, this doesn't allow any kind of habituation. So if you show somebody a face, and then you immediately show them another face, you don't get quite as good a response. There's habituation. That's nonlinear. Any kind of habituation response is nonlinear, so we're not modeling that here. Uh, but all, virtually all fMRI analysis is done this way. Why do we do it this way? Uh, well, we understand linear. It says we're, it's where we're aiming the flashlight to look for the, or, you know, we're going around the street lamp to look for the lost wallet. So um, you can sort of, you understand how linear works and you understand what its problems are. And even though, you know, reality isn't linear, you, you, you still often use linear models. So, so why, but why the reverse? Why does the reverse make sense? And so let's imagine, so here's our, you know, here's our hemodynamic response function, impulse response function. Um, and here's our, uh, here's our, that same experimental design. There was three, uh, three impulses like that. So that's, you know, this is our experiment. And then, uh, and then um, we've got our, uh, yeah. Let me do it the other way around. Put the yeah, no, I got it. Sorry, I already had it up there. Uh, so here's our human advocacy response function, uh, and now what we want to do is just figure out uh, for a particular point uh, what I'll just draw it uh, separate here. So let's say we want to figure out for this point what the uh, value of you know. So that this point would be like like for this point right here, how do we figure out like what is this value? 
And so an easy graphical way to understand this is take your hemodynamic response function like that and just reverse it. So put it like that. And the way we figure out what the, what the convolution is for that point is, so this is all zero here, so we, so we just multiply that you know, times zero, all zero. And then that's the only one, say this is one here, so we multiply that number by one, and then there's a bunch of zeros in between, then we multiply this number by one, then we multiply uh, this number by one, and then add them up. So add them up. So remember, uh, the, the final part that we didn't put here is that, you know, once we've done all those multiplications, then we've got to sum them, right? Because that's, uh, that's our, our integral there. So we multiply all those pairs, sum the whole mess up, do the same thing here. So in this case, it's all zeros except for just these three numbers that have one, and you multiply them by that. And that generates this number. So once you, you know, sum, sum them up, that's how you get this number. Uh, so it's just the sum. And so why does it make sense for it to go backwards like that? Well, at this point, we're very close to this impulse. And so that means that this impulse just started. And so we're on the early part of the response of this impulse response function. Here, we're about like halfway through the impulse response function. That's further, further back in time. That's sort of the back in time idea. And then this one uh, is a long time after the impulse response function. So if you look at it this way, it sort of makes sense why we want to you know, want to reverse it. And how would you calculate the next time point? So if you wanted to calculate this time point, what do we do? We just paste our impulse response function a little bit further over to the right. And then in that case, we would go and uh, you know, multiply this guy times that number, and this guy times that number, and then this guy times that number there. And uh, you know, sum this guy up, and then that would basically give us you know, our next point in the curve, you know, right here. So. So you can see why it's sort of, you know, <coughs> in the end, it sort of makes sense to, uh, to, to reverse things. It's par partly, it's, it has to do with, I always say, it partly has to do with the fact that you always think of time as going to the right, you know, like in a, on a graph. Whereas, you know, if you ask somebody out, you know, out in the bush, they might say time is going forward or maybe time's going, you're, you're, you're moving through time and time's behind you. <laughs> but if... <coughs> If you're a scientist with a graph, time goes to the right. And so now it's sort of like, why should it go to the left? <laughs> um, but uh, uh, it makes sense because something is being played out over time. So, so any questions about uh, the convolution, hemodynamic response function? So basically the idea is that we've got, we've got some experimental design and then we have some hemodynamic response function, which we, 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 we could try to estimate it, directly estimate it, by doing flashes and calculate the impulse response function, or we could just say, I think this is what it is, because you know many people have done fMRI experiments, and I'll just use this one. Or you could solve for it. It's also possible to actually try to solve for what this unknown hemodynamic response function is. And how do you do that? Well, you've got your data, you know, so this is your this is your actual data, and this is known, you know, your experimental design is known. And so this one can also be an unknown. And you can do something called you know, deconvolution, which is how do, we solve, how do we solve for the hemodynamic response function given our data and our known experiment? So, uh, and, and that's what, I'll talk about. that's what I'll talk about on Friday, like how do, we, how do we do this, like solve for an unknown hemodynamic response function. But you can also just, you can also just try to you can just paste one in that's sort of an average one, or you can just try to directly measure it. And the way you would directly measure it is you would just do something like, it's a very boring experiment, I've done these before, just turn a flash on, like a flash on a, you know, like a, just flash a face up, and then wait 30 seconds, <laughs> uh, you know, and then you'll, you'll see your hemodynamic response function 
you know, slowly come out. It's an extremely boring experiment because it's like one flash and you're sitting there, beep, 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 beep. He says, come on, get the next flash. <laughs> but if you do that, then you could actually estimate what the hemodynamic response function is and then insert that into your analysis. But you can also solve for it uh, to, you know, as an unknown given your data and, and your, your, your known experiment. This is your known experiment. Okay, so any questions about uh, convolution or Fourier phase encoded analysis? which is just yet another version of linear. Okay. Yeah, this, to my mind, this is the easiest way of sort of thinking about it. You know, you do something, something happens. It's nice and causal. <laughs> and then you just like basically paste them on top of each other. You know, but in practice, this is, and this is what you do to actually actually calculate it. And that sort of, and then it all sort of makes sense why, why we have that minus, minus in there. Because you're sort of going back in time. <laughs> the general sort of convolution theorem, this general thing would, you know, would basically, you know, these are all zeros over here, right? So, so, you're still effectively doing, you know, the entire universe of Z. <laughs> it's just that it's all zero. Uh, it's all uh, zero on the, the left side of the convolution, uh, left side of the hemodynamic response function, impulse response function. If you want a causal, that's if you want a, a sort of a causal situation. You don't, you don't want stuff that hasn't happened yet affecting, affecting, affecting you. Sometimes you want to do that. If you want to do a filter, you might do a filter that way where you could go back in time and get some, or you know, go ahead in time before something has happened and sort of like insert something. But for a standard impulse response function, it's gonna be zero for any negative number. Okay, guess we'll uh, call it a day there. <laughs> Okay, see you guys. <laughs>